I always think it's good to think about how you arrive at the work that you do. Like there's always a story to the combinations that we we bring to our work and to the world. And, you know, I'm somebody who was basically improperly trained. I wasn't given a discipline. I began in an English department, but I was really interested in philosophy. But where I was, philosophy was analytical philosophy. So that wasn't a place I could go. So I was in English literature department, sort of doing a bit of theory, really interested in feminist ideas. And that meant that I never had a very sort of straight path from an academic point of view. I was always um, working in a slightly devi deviant way. And so for me, um, I really was interested in philosophical questions about the nature of meaning and reality and identity. But I also wanted to explore power, power relations as they manifest not only in institutional contexts but in everyday life. So the combination of philosophical modes of inquiry with feminist and queer colour of critique really comes from the questions I'm asking. Um, the questions lead me along these different paths. So if I'm interested in the question of happiness, say, that does require looking at the history of ideas, philosophical histories, about ways, ways in which happiness has been thought or understood as being a good thing and appreciating some of the differences in that history. But it also is about thinking about how happiness gets used in everyday situations and speech acts and ways of understanding our relationships to each other or how happiness gets used in institutional settings as a way of describing the commitments of a university, say, diversity is happiness, say. So the kind of combination really comes from the questions that for me, what's really interesting about a word like happiness or a word like the will or a word like complaint, all of these individual words is that they do have philosophical histories, but they also get used in everyday life and in institutional cultures. So to, for me, I'm following the words and the concepts and the words and the concepts take me to these different places and philosophy is a place I'm taken to. It is not the point of my work, it never has been. I'm not a philosopher by training or by interest or orientation. And yet because I'm interested in the world making nature of words and concepts, philosophy becomes one of the places that I go along, along with other places. Yeah, I think um, it was very important in a way that having a blog has allowed me to have a much more direct relation to, to readers than you would have through a book. I mean, you, you, you write a book and you send it out and every now and then you find out someone's read it and you go, oh, someone's read it. I'm not just writing these books that nothing happens to them. But with a blog, there's a much more of an immediacy. There's a much more of a sense of there's a community of readers and other writers who are writing blogs too and that you're participating in creating something that's common and shared. So the kind of the timing of it, the fact that you write it and it's out there and it goes out onto your Twitter feed and you get people commenting, that, that, that kind of sense of the liveliness of the writing is something that I, has really come about for me through the blog itself. And I think, you know, I, I, my writing was change, has changed gradually over the course of my academic career. I became very interested in the word diversity and what it was doing and I was following that word around, this time not just by talking to a tape recorder or reading philosophical texts, but by talking to people, to practitioners who were involved in trying to institutionalise commitments to diversity and they kind of, the, the sense of being interested in the words themselves and where they go really helped me to hear what people were saying to me. And one of the things that, that um, happened, not straight away, but after I finished the research for that book, when I began to really notice that diversity practitioners in their writing talked often about walls, brick walls, as the things they came up against. And I think it was partly because I've become so aware of the words themselves that I began to actually think about what these words were telling us in terms of evoking a particular kind of relationship to the institution. And then uh, Living a Feminist Life was the book I was writing alongside the blog. And I thought of that book and that blog as being written together. So blogs became chapters and chapters became blogs. There was a, there was a real dialogue. And, and Living a Feminist Life really brings together the earlier work on being included on diversity work with my more phenolo phenological approach. And I, I think, um, the, both, both of those pieces of writing were 
being done at the same time as I was involved in these inquiries into sexual harassment and sexual misconduct at Goldsmith. So they, were, they both came out of a sense of urgency about what are we going to do here and now with this problem that is here and now. It's not over there. It's not a, an object somewhere else. It's right here in the institution that I'm in. And I had to write my way around it and through it to make sense of what was going on. So both of those book and blog were hugely important to me and the writing really changed. Um, well, it's funny because when I first said I was going to write a book on happiness, my mum said to me, Sarah, what are you going to do next? I said, oh, you know, I'm going to write a book on happiness. And she's like, hooray, you know, laugh, something positive. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> I don't think so. So for me, I, I wanted to write about happiness. Every project has come from, from the project before. And there were a couple of things that led me to happiness. Uh, certainly it was from doing the diversity research. It was overwhelming to me how often the diversity practitioners would talk about the use of diversity in the way that evoked directly some of the second wave feminist critiques of how images of the happy housewife were being used to make th things appear um, beautiful or, or venerable or desirable um, in a way that obscured the, the, the labour and the problem that has no name. Um, so that I wanted to write about that, the, the, the way in which happiness can be used to conceal um, all that doesn't meet its demand. And the other thing was seeing the film Bend It Like Beckham, which like, got me so cross. Because it was an interesting film, and I really, really liked this film, but the happiness of that ending, when all their pain and the pathos of past memories of racism experienced by the father of the Jess in the film is overcome by playing the game and by proximity to the white man in the ending. And it's just kind of like the use of happiness to imply that our task is just to get over racism, to put it behind you, to happiness as a kind of forward orientation that then very quickly becomes an injunction to put those memories of racism, of whatever forms of power stop you from doing or being as you wish to do or be, to put those things behind you. So the, the, the sense that happiness was doing something, um, that it was actually rendering those who were not happy responsible for their own misfortune, that it was obscuring ongoing relations of inequality and violence and injustice, and that it was narrowing our idea of what a life can be. All of that led me to happiness. But when I first began the research for the book, I think I was actually myself quite overwhelmed by how consistently feminists had involved have been involved in direct critiques of that happiness injunction. So when I'm making a critique of the happiness duty, I'm not being original. Very rarely are we as feminists being original. I was drawing upon a much earlier established feminist critique, including something like um, Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex, where she said it's always easy to describe as happy the situation in which one wishes to place others. Like, how perfectly wise is that? And so I, I, was, I was actually, you know, part of a much longer genealogy of feminists who were quite clearly showing that happiness was being used to, to make a social norm, a social convention into a good thing, because that's how you can make something appear to be good, by making it appear to be the cause of, happy, of happiness. Because what was unquestionable throughout the very varied histories of philosophy, or, or Western philosophy on happiness, was the idea that happiness is what you want and happiness is a good thing. So it was very important to begin to think about that freedom to be happy is actually really about a, 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 not only an injunction but a duty to be happy and to, a duty to be happy is a duty to live your life in a way that would make others happy because if certain people come first and that might mean parents but it might also mean citizens or hosts then their happiness comes first so the happiness duty really means a duty to follow other people's goods. So doing the critique of happiness doesn't mean I'm not saying we should thus all be unhappy, as if that's some sort of duty. And killing joy isn't even about necessarily being unhappy. It is simply saying if happiness is found in those places and if pointing out unhappiness or power makes other people unhappy, then I'm willing to make other people unhappy. So I think I have been writing about complaint for quite a long time. And I think... Um, it's easy to think about the ways in which complaint is heard as being negative. And I'm very, I'm, I think it's very important to me 
as a starting point to say what counts as complaint is always a political question. So sometimes you could be saying, for, for example, you might say, uh, excuse me, this room is not accessible to people with, uh, uh, who have a wheelchair or who have difficulties with mobility, and you'll be making a point about who can and cannot enter that room, that point will be heard as a complaint. And in being heard as a complaint, you have two consequences. Firstly, it is understood as a negative speech, as negative insofar as it requires tra modifying an existing arrangement. So the fact that that tends to be heard as a complaint is telling us something about the way in which many existing arrangements get justified as being about the preservation of the accessibility or the well-being of those who have made those arrangements. Um, but also, what I've learned is that you can be trying to make a complaint in your own terms. I make a complaint about racism, and it just won't trigger the kind of set of formal processes that allow that intervention to be registered as a complaint. So some forms of politics are heard as complaint even if they're not intended as such, and some are not heard as complaint even when they are intended as such. So the question of what gets counted as a complaint is, is part of the politics of this, this research. And I'm certainly interested in the exhaustion and the wear and tear. One of the themes of living a feminist life was wear and tear, like how exhausting it can be to be in a world that doesn't recognise who it is that you are, or it doesn't enable your existence, that doesn't give you the room, that doesn't allow you into the room or allow you to be in that room because of who is there and what they're doing and what they're saying, those forms can make it actually un unbeable, that's a word, it is now. <laughs> um, a, a lot of the work around, around complaint is just sort of trying to sort of th think through the, the, that, the exhaustion that leads you to say, well, I need to make a complaint about the situation that I'm in, but also then the exhaustion of having to make that complaint. Like, it can be the exhaustion that leads you there, but what you have to do in order to take the complaint forward is even more exhausting. So the work on complaint has been very much about really trying to, to think through the politics of exhaustion and how spaces end up being occupied because trying to challenge how they are occupied, trying to challenge sexism and racism in, in ordinary everyday institutional spaces, for instance, is just made too much. And it became really a question about sort of thinking about negativity, who gets assigned as being negative. Um, but, it, but, it's, but also became a really uh, a project that was um, just trying to listen to people's ordinary ways of handling a situation where they know that what's, what they find in an institution is unacceptable. It shouldn't be that way. It's, it's um, uh, something that they have to challenge and it's trying to think through what's it like to do that work and what do we learn actually about power from the efforts to challenge power and um, just really it is very much focused on the actual experience itself, the experience of making a complaint um, or the experiences that lead you to be understood as making a complaint by both of them. Um, and I found that really the experiences that lead to complaint and the experiences of complaint are very hard to untangle. And complaints can actually begin before you even think about yourself as making a complaint. Um, in the lecture tonight, I'll talk about a couple of examples where the complaint actually began in the killjoy moment, in the moment where somebody was showing by virtue of not laughing along at a sexist joke that they had a problem with what was going on. And because they weren't laughing at a sexist joke or they weren't laughing at a racist joke, they become the objects of the violence in the room. They become the targets. Because if you aren't saying, yes, this is okay, you stand out and that violence gets directed at you. And that, that mere small, tiny fact tells us so much about the way in which the person who tries to say no to something, actually often what they're saying no to gets intensified and directed at them all the more. So the more you identify harassment, the more you are harassed. Often when there are moments of public um, awareness of how serious and intractable these problems are around specifically sexual misconduct and sexual harassment, there is a lot of activity. There's a lot of attempt to show people's commitments to challenging that situation. And those commitments might be well-meaning. I'm not 
um, making any comment about how people intend their commitments, but all of these activities can also be the problem given new form because in the UK at least a lot has been a lot of attention has been given to creating new complaints procedures as if the procedures themselves will mean we've addressed the problem but you can change how you address the problem without actually addressing the problem and I, I also sort of see it as you can creating evidence of doing something is not the same thing as doing something so one of my concepts of the, of the non-performative has become quite useful for my complaint project because it's been about think about all the ways in which activities that are undertaken are undertaken at kind of at a surface level without really fundamentally having the difficult conversations about why these problems keep coming up in the first place. What is it about academic norms and conventions that makes it so hard to address the institutionalising of sexual harassment and sexual misconduct? If I'm going to say what should the new direction should be, we need to start talking about the problems without saying, or it's without the assumption that the most helpful approach is to talk about positively about the solutions. We need to actually say and have a conversation about what the problems are without making the people who talk about the problems into the problem, which is what happens so often in so many university contexts, that those who really try and give problems their names become the problems. And then it's assumed that if those people go away, the problems go with them. I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm immersed in complaint. And I'm not really, I, I'm thinking maybe that I will want to do a book that's a bit like On Being Included, a very, uh, quite, a quite systematic um, presentation of my findings from talking to formerly 40 people, informally up to 200 people about their complaint experiences at universities. And very, very detailed analysis of what goes on, um, because I think the detail really matters. But then also perhaps doing something a little bit more creative around how, how else to how else to share the findings with the people that have shared their stories with me because the work is a very collective work. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm there because of my own complaint experiences and my own kind of history of feminist thought that brings me to the project, but the people I'm talking to are there because of their complaint experiences and their own history of feminist thought that brings them to the project. And so I want to think about maybe being involved in some more creative forms of um, co-publishing, um, podcasts perhaps, complaint dialogues, complaint collectives. I was thinking maybe like a complaint handbook or a killjoy handbook that would allow me to sort of make the project or the writing less about the university as a site and more about well what do we learn from the ways in which people try and challenge abuses of power across a range of different settings.